Dr. Duck was the one that could tell some stories. He told one about going across the river in Marshall to a, a lady that was her husband had called and said she was fixing to deliver. And he went and he realized she was in false labor. So he told the husband, I'll be back tomorrow. And the husband reached up on the wall and took his shotgun down and said, you're not going anywhere. And he spent the night at the house. <laughs> And the baby didn't deliver that night, but you know, he would tell all kinds of stories. You've been listening to my friend Ellen Coomer relate a story about Dr. Duck, who she worked with as a nurse in rural Madison County, North Carolina, where she was born and raised. Throughout her long and storied life, Ellen has played a central role in her community, where her life has touched so many others in a positive way. Ellen grew up in the remote mountains of western North Carolina, the daughter of a tenant farmer. In her late teens, she made the decision to go off to school at Berea College in Kentucky, where she studied nursing, met her husband, and started a family. Later, she and her family returned to Madison County, where she applied her nursing skills to help her local community, taking a job in health services at Mars Hill College. Through the story she tells, you'll learn more about this amazing lady in the communities in Appalachia where she lived and worked. They not only reflect her life's path, but also shine a light on the land and people who shaped her and the times she has lived through. Ellen is a prominent figure in the community and is related to so many of the families in the county that everyone seems to know her. They all hold her in high regard, and one can't ask for much more than that. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Come on, in, come on in out of the cold. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having us over today. Well, I'm glad to see you. I'm Ellen Harmon Coomer, and I was born on Big Laurel at home. I lived there till I was five years old, and then my family moved to Grapevine. I started school when I was five years old. We didn't have a kindergarten. I started school when I was five, and we walked to Ivy Ridge School, which is no longer there, and uh, went there till I was in the second grade, and then we moved to Grapevine. So, and I went to school at Grapevine Elementary through the seventh grade, and then I went to Marshall High School on the island. Graduated from there. 1956, went to Berea College, majored in nursing, lived in Kentucky for Counton College about, uh, oh, from 58 till 68, and then we moved to Florida for five years. And then we came back to God's country, <laughs> Madison County. So, and what year were you born? I was born in 1939. What did you do about clothes growing up? Did you buy them off the shelf? Um, we did because my mother didn't like to sew that much, and she didn't have a. I don't think she had a sewing machine till we were in high school, and Daddy bought one because we had to have one in home ec. But. Uh, I guess I, I remember buying clothes at Claude Cody's store on Big Laurel. Because do you know his store? And I guess Marshall. Now, when I got old enough in the home ec, I would make clothes myself because I enjoyed it, you know. But, uh, and I don't know who else might have made them. Maybe they were hand-me-downs and I just didn't know it. <laughs> but... Uh, and of course the boys, most of them wore overalls, you know. It was kind of strange to see a kid with a pair of pants on going to school, you know. And, uh, and you wore them. It wasn't fashionable then to have a hole in them, but you didn't wear them with a hole. Your mother patched them, you know. And But now uh, they wear them, they look like they've, you know, my grandchildren used to wear them like that, you know. 
but uh, and you wore clothes till you outgrew them, and then the younger one or younger ones got them, you know. But we didn't have a lot of clothes, as I remember. We got we loved when May or June got here because we got to go barefooted. But you got one pair of shoes usually in the winter, I mean before winter, when school started. Um, and you were expected to keep those till, till you could go barefooted. And I remember, and I think it's so simple. We would get one pencil. There was no such thing as a ballpoint pen. I guess we had fountain pens back then. And uh, but my daddy, when we were little, I mean, you know, first, second grade, he would take, we'd get a pencil, and he would take his knife and cut a little ring right below the eraser, of the metal part, and put a string around it and make us carry it around our neck so we didn't lose it. Because I guess pencils, I don't know how expensive they were, but it was just something you didn't play around with. You hang, you hung on to them. Paper, you got notebook paper, you know. And I don't know if the school gave that out or not. I don't remember. We had to practice writing. We had lined paper, <coughs> excuse me. We had to sit there and practice and practice so we could learn how to write properly, I guess. Um, we did a play every year, maybe at Christmas time. I remember one time I was the angel, which <laughs> truly I wasn't. But um, it was basic, you know, like math and that, math and reading and English, I guess. And when I was seventh grade, I learned to talk too much. So I used, I used to have to write I will, I mean, speech is silver, or silence is silver, speech is gold, or something like that. We'd have to write it a thousand times, and I was always getting in trouble that way, talking too much. So, but I enjoyed those days, you know, because when, because we all grew up there together, and then when we went to the big city of Marshall or Mars Hill, <laughs> You know, we didn't know any of the kids and this kind of stuff in it. And I guess you would, I don't think they actually bullied us, but they teased us because we were from the country. That's why I didn't like Mars Hill. And now I love Mars Hill. Uh, right before you get to Arrington Branch, and it was a big two-store, not two-store, big white school, had um, outdoor bathrooms up the hill and we had water I think the water was piped in from a spring and uh, uh, the teacher she would teach first grade for a while second grade for a while you know we all were one through three was in the little room the big room was four through seven so and most of us knew everybody. I mean, you know, most of us were related, actually. <laughs> a lot of coaches went to school there. Did you ever take your lunch, or did they prepare? Oh, no. We had to take our lunch. There was no such thing as a lunchroom in those schools. I'm sure in all the schools. I don't know, but, but no, we would take it, and it was ate it cold if it was cold, you know, because there was no way of heating it or anything, but all the kids did. I remember taking, I, I guess it was cornbread and milk in a little pint jar. I mean, I don't remember too much what else we took. Now there was a store right as you turn up Arrington Branch across the road, and it was Peggy's great uncle's store. And during recess, our teacher would let us go up there if we had any money, which most of us didn't. And we could buy, you know, candy bar or something like that. But that reminded me when Nathan was in school. Nathan did not like school. And he would sneak off. And the, and the teacher, 
expected me and my sister to chase him down. Well, we weren't going to chase him down. And he would, <laughs> he would go up and turn up Arrington Branch, because that's when we lived on Arrington Branch. And the first house had uh, the people that lived there had a barn with a hayloft. And Nathan would climb up in that hayloft and just lay there and play or do whatever till we got ready to walk home. You know, when we'd get there, he'd walk on home like he'd been in school all day. Well, tell me who, who's in this photograph. That's me and my three siblings. Nathan and I are on the bottom and my older brother, Roy, and my sister, Alta, or better known as Susie. And they were teenagers. I, I was probably 13, 14, I'm not sure exactly. There was about two years difference in all of us. So. Where was that made? Uh, we lived on Walnut Creek. I don't remember. I was in the eighth grade, so I was probably 13 at that time. We lived, I've forgotten exactly where, but somewhere on Walnut Creek, because my dad was a tenant farmer and he would, you know, rent wherever they had tobacco crops and that kind of stuff. Did you have um, animals on your place growing up? Did mm -hmm. you always have? Well, Daddy always had a horse, which we all got to ride. My sister and I'd go out in the pasture and ride it bareback sometimes. We always had a milk cow because we had our own milk. Raised at least one pig a year, you know. And we we had dogs and cats. And when Daddy would do his spring plowing, if he plowed out a nest of, or whatever they were called, of little groundhogs, which he always did in the spring, he'd bring them home. And we'd keep them till they got big enough, and then he'd make us turn them loose. You know, I felt bad now that I know about it that the poor mother, you know, wondered what happened to them. But we had chickens and that kind of stuff chickens. Once we had some ducks, but we didn't keep them very long. Mostly chickens. So. Did they ever make you handle the chicken for dinner? I remember helping grandmother pull the feathers, pluck them, whatever they were called. My, I remember my mother trying one time to kill a chicken. Bless her heart. She didn't they used to, I mean, the grandmother would wring its neck, literally. I mean, she'd do, you know, just gross me out. But my mother was going to cut its head off with the axe. Well, she wasn't successful the first time. And that, that poor chicken flopped around in the yard. That was the only time she ever tried it. She wouldn't do it, you know. But they would, you know. And we, we'd kill pigs and stuff, and now, to me, that is... I mean, my son has pigs over where he lives. They're actually his sons who moved to the beach. And to think about killing those pigs after you raise them, it's just, I don't feel good about it anymore. But growing up, that was not, you didn't think a thing about it. I mean, that was just a way of life. And the Community, I mean, several men would help each other, you know, this, you know, and you'd kill a hog, you know. But when I was growing up, the only meat I ever ate was uh, everybody killed a hog in the winter, I guess, or chicken, because grandmother raised her own chickens and killed them herself. <laughs> I can remember seeing her kill them. And, uh, but I never. Probably I never ate beef till I was maybe in high school because we didn't, we just didn't eat it. I mean, you know, some, I guess some people might have raised their own beef cattle, but granddaddy didn't and my dad didn't. So we ate chicken and we ate chicken for breakfast, which I still love, you know, but, uh, 
um, grandmother would always cook a big meal and it was mostly stuff she'd grown like um, corn, beans, that kind of stuff. Granddaddy made his own grape juice and I loved that. He had a certain amount of, of grape vines that were different and we weren't allowed to pick the grapes off of those, but we'd sneak in there and hide, because you could hide in the grape, you know, the, and get some of them, but um, he had his own bees and raised his, I mean, you know, had homemade honey or whatever. So they were, uh, I don't know what they went to the grocery store for, maybe sugar and whatever. Granddaddy had grew his own wheat I can remember when they would come, the threshers, I guess you call them, and grandmother would cook for them, you know, and they'd have a huge bin in the old store that used to, Johnny used to have the little country store over there. But it was not a store at that time, and granddaddy would store his wheat in there, and we'd get in it and play in it. He didn't know we did that, though. And then they'd take it to the mill because there was a, a couple of men that owned mills, Silver's Mill and another one. I can't remember what it was called. But they raised and Daddy would take his corn and have it ground in the corn mill. So you mostly walk instead of ride horses if you went somewhere because you only had one horse, I guess? Um, we walked, yeah. Or later, as we got older, if one of our uncles, by that time, they some uh, would have a car and they'd take us somewhere, you know. But I remember one time my daddy had a horse and a sled and he would come across the mountain and come to maybe the grandmother and granddaddy's and maybe the store down, down the road and fill the sled full. And I always went where he went. And he tied me onto the top of the sled so I wouldn't fall off going up the mountain. And uh, I can remember him telling me he would give me 50 cents if I would get off and walk because it was too, I must have weighed too much or something. Because <laughs> it was too hard for the horse to pull the sled and me, and I wouldn't get off because I didn't want to, you know. But uh, we mostly did walking. And I think, man, that was good for us. When I was little, uh, when we lived on Laurel, we would walk, because my dad didn't drive, we didn't have a car, we'd walk across what was called the Freeman, Freeman Holler, it's now called the Hilton Holler, that was my uncle. Uh, we would walk and go to Arrington Branch Church, because uh, my mother grew up there. And grandmother, as I had said earlier, she fed every, half the people that went to church. I mean, she had, I remember she had a huge oak table and uh, the kids didn't wait or have their own little table. The adults would sit around the table and the kids would stand in between the adults and we'd all eat around the table. And grandmother did this every Sunday and every once in a while she'd have just family like when my uncle went to, he fought in World War II, the, the day he left, I remember that. I don't know how old I was. Not old, four or five maybe. How'd you get interested in nursing, Princess? Um, well, I do remember as a child, uh, the only time I was ever at the doctor's office till I went for my physical to Berea, because you didn't go to the doctor for routine checkups. You went when you were sick or dying, <laughs> basically. Uh, but I fell, and I still have the scar to show it, I fell in the fire. Uh, we had a fireplace, and you didn't have fire screens back then. And luckily it just burnt my hand, and my daddy brought me to Mars Hill to a doctor. But I can remember my mother making different kinds of tea for us to drink. Um, and I remember I used to have earaches and she'd put warm sweet oil in my ear. I don't know if it helped or not. But when we had the measles, when we had the measles, every kid in Grapevine Elementary except two boys 
got the measles. And they literally closed the school. And But they would give you hot tea of some kind to, quote, break the measles out. I guess they were going to, the rash would appear whether you drank that tea or not, I'm sure. But the reason I got interested in I really didn't know what I wanted to major in at Berea. I started out in home ec and realized that was not for me. I had a classmate, or a, a girl that graduated from Mars Hill a year after I did, and she was going into nursing. And I thought, well, I'll do that too. I had no idea, because I'd never been in the hospital. I went to the waiting room one time when grandmother was there. Back then, the kids weren't allowed to go in the hospital. That's the only time I was ever in the hospital, till I was a nursing student. And once I got in it, I loved it. But then I, my dad reminded me when I was four, and I do remember it, he bought me a nurse's kit for Christmas. And I remember the little stethoscope and everything. My dad was basically illiterate because he had to quit school when he was 10. He was the oldest of four children, and his dad died. And his mother, I guess, didn't have any skills except housekeeping, that kind of stuff. So my dad literally had to quit school and help her with the three younger children. But he always wanted, and I guess I was the one of the four that really liked school. And he would teach me to spell words before I ever went to school, this kind of stuff. And my mother taught him how to read after they were married. So, but, but once I got into nursing, I, I loved it, and I, I did 54 years before I decided to quit. <laughs> so, I have two sons, Brian and Brett. Uh, Brian worked. He grad, He went to Mars Hill College. He. He worked for Bruce Goforth Builders for about 20 years till the recession hit. And then he worked for Madison County Schools um, for two or three years. And now he's retired, stays home and raises pigs and chickens, lives on Grapevine, close to where my parents lived. His wife's a school teacher and they have two boys. And he loves the mountains as much as I do. My younger son, Brett, he works at a plant in Marshall called Bucci. He has three daughters, and two of them went to App State, and one of them lives in Colorado, and none of them are married. So, and they've always been over overly protective of me if they think I need something they're right here I've never I've never had to ask them not I mean to do anything that they wouldn't do and I of course I'm prejudiced but I think they're good good guys you know How about grandchildren I have five grandchildren I have two grandsons they're Brian's and Lisa, his wife, and the three daughters um, are Brett. And the the boys are, we always say the boys, they're Jesse and Isaac. We say they were named out of the Bible. And they weren't, they were family names. But And then the girls are all nature names, Fern, Ivy, and Violet. And... Uh, They've always, when they were little, they would stay with me every time they'd get a chance and that kind of stuff. So they're, they're good kids. I'm very fortunate to have, have them. This picture of my husband, Burke Coomer, and it was taken when he was eight years old. His mother wanted a picture to send her, her two sons who were serving in World War II. And of course, he was the baby of eight, and so everybody, you know, wanted to see him. He had a brother in the Navy and one in the regular Army, and later he had, 
another brother in the regular army, and a brother-in-law. There were four at one time in the military. So, And he never went because when he was 13 months old, he crawled up behind a little boy playing with a coal pick. And you can't really see it in this picture, but the little boy hit him in his right eye and blinded him. So anyway, he never had to go to the military, you know, because of that. This is my mother and father, Mida Coates Harmon and Ralph Harmon. And this actually was taken the day she had her cerebral hemorrhage. This was the last picture she would, had ever had made. And they were married in 1933 in December. And they had four children and I was the third one. So and we lived on Big Laurel till I was five and then we moved to Great Dunn because her mother and daddy lived, was on Great Dunn. He was a farmer and worked hard all his life, and she did too. But we always knew we were loved. That's the one thing I always think of. If you share my interest in the people and places I call home, be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons to learn more about this way of life. On this channel, I hope to continue to honor the people, vibrant culture, and strong traditions of Appalachia.